This is William Huang, and welcome to the pharmacology section on autonomic drugs. The autonomic nervous system is the main route by which the central nervous system communicates with involuntary tissues like smooth muscle, heart muscle, and glands. It can be divided into two major segments, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic, which conceptually can be thought to oppose each other's actions. Sympathetic is classically described as fight or flight. Parasympathetic is classically described as rest and digest. The autonomic nervous system is a disynaptic system, and the first synapse, or preganglionic synapse, is always acetylcholine acting on a nicotinic receptor. The adrenal medulla is the one exception to the disynaptic system, as the preganglionic neuron terminates directly on the end organ. Recall, however, the adrenal medulla is derived from neural crest tissue. It can be thought of as being a ganglion itself, which releases catecholamines postsynaptically into the bloodstream. Acetylcholine is also the neurotransmitter of the postganglionic neuron in the parasympathetic system, usually acting on a muscarinic receptor. The sympathetic nervous system, on the other hand, communicates with end organs via norepinephrine acting on alpha or beta receptors. Exceptions to this are sweat glands, which have acetylcholine acting on muscarinic receptors, as in parasympathetic postganglionic synapses, and renal vascular smooth muscle, which has dopamine acting on D1 receptors. Most end organs are duly innervated by both the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. There are two major types of acetylcholine receptors, nicotinic and muscarinic. Nicotinic receptors are ligand-gated sodium-potassium channels that open when acetylcholine binds. There are two types, NN or nicotinic neuronal found in autonomic ganglia and NM nicotinic muscular found in neuromuscular junction. Muscarinic receptors are G-protein coupled receptors that act through second messengers. There are five subtypes, M1 through M5. The M2 and M3 subtypes are the most important for step one. G-protein-linked second messengers are an important topic for step one. The alpha-1 receptor is of the GQ class and mediates the majority of functions for the sympathetic nervous system, including vascular smooth muscle contraction, pupillary dilator muscle contraction or medriasis, and intestinal and bladder sphincter muscle contraction. The alpha-2 receptor is of the GI class and is located presynaptically, acting as a negative feedback mechanism to decrease sympathetic outflow. It also decreases insulin release from the pancreas. The beta-1 receptor is of the GS class and acts to increase heart rate, contractility, renin release, and lipolysis. The beta-2 receptor is of the GS class. Most beta-2 receptors are not innervated directly, but rather are stimulated by epinephrine released from the adrenal medulla. They mediate vasodilation, bronchodilation, increase heart rate and contractility, increase lipolysis, increase insulin release, and decrease uterine tone. This last property is the basis for many drugs that delay childbirth. The M1 receptor is of the GQ class and is found in the CNS and enteric nervous system. It is probably not that important for step 1. The M2 receptor is of the GI class and its most important role is as an inhibitory receptor found in the nodal tissue of the heart. It decreases heart rate and contractility of the atria, which is why atropine, an inhibitor of this receptor, can be given for bradycardia. The M3 receptor is of the GQ class and mediates smooth muscle contraction, such as gut peristalsis, bladder contraction, bronchoconstriction, pupillary sphincter muscle contraction or meiosis, and ciliary muscle contraction or accommodation. It also increases exocrine gland secretion, such as sweat and gastric acid. The D1 receptor is of the GS class and it relaxes renal vascular smooth muscle, thereby increasing renal blood flow. The D2 receptor is of the GI class and modulates neurotransmitter release in the brain. The H1 receptor is of the GQ class and mediates increased nasal and bronchial mucus production, contraction of the bronchioles, pruritus, and pain. The H2 receptor is of the GS class and is found on parietal cells in the stomach. When stimulated, it increases gastric acid secretion. The V1 receptor is of the GQ class and it increases vascular smooth muscle contraction. The V2 receptor is of the GS class, and it increases water permeability and reabsorption in the collecting tubules of the kidney. To remember all of these receptor G-protein relationships, you can use the following mnemonic, kiss and kick till you're sick of sex. Notice that the spelling isn't accurate English, but just remember that the only letters you have are S, I, and Q, and it should be easier to remember this mnemonic. Now let's talk about the signaling cascades for the various G-proteins. H1, alpha-1, 
V1, M1, and M3 receptors all use GQ, which you can remember with the mnemonic have one m and m GQ activates phospholipase C, which cleaves plasma membrane lipids to produce PIP2, which then splits into IP3, which is in the cytoplasm, and DAG, which remains membrane-bound. IP3 stimulates the endoplasmic reticulum to release calcium, increasing the intracellular calcium concentration. DAG stimulates protein kinase C, which phosphorylates downstream messengers. Beta-1, beta-2, D1, H2, and V2 receptors all use GS. GS stimulates adenylyl cyclase to produce cyclic AMP from ATP. Cyclic AMP activates protein kinase A, which phosphorylates downstream messengers. M2, alpha-2, and D2 receptors all use GI, which you can remember with the mnemonic MAD2s. Stimulation of GI receptors leads to inhibition of adenylyl cyclase, which leads to a drop in cyclic AMP concentration within the cell and subsequent decrease in active protein kinase A. Let's move on to autonomic drugs. First, we'll focus on the cholinergic synapse. Choline is taken up from the extracellular space and combined with acetyl-CoA by choline acetotransferase to produce acetylcholine. Remember from biochemistry that glycolysis transforms glucose into pyruvate, which is then converted by pyruvate dehydrogenase into acetyl-CoA. Hemicholinium can compete with choline in this step and prevent choline from being taken up into the presynaptic neuron. Once acetylcholine has been made, the next step is to package it into vesicles. Vosamicol can compete with acetylcholine in this step and prevent packaging into vesicles. Depolarization of the presynaptic neuron causes voltage-dependent calcium channels to open, leading to an influx of calcium. This leads to vesicles fusing with the presynaptic membrane, releasing acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. Botulinum toxin inhibits synaptobrevin, a snare protein that mediates the fusion of vesicles with the presynaptic membrane. Hence, botulinum prevents acetylcholine release. This prevents muscle contraction, leading to flaccid paralysis. Sweating is mediated by muscarinic receptors as well, so botulinum toxin prevents sweating. Once in the synaptic space, acetylcholine is enzymatically degraded by acetylcholine esterase, which splits acetylcholine into choline plus acetate. Choline can then be reabsorbed and recycled. Now let's turn to the noradrenergic synapse. The noradrenergic synapse is where catecholamines such as dopamine and norepinephrine are assembled, packaged, and released. First, tyrosine, the precursor of all catecholamines, is transported into the synapse. Once inside, tyrosine is converted to dopa and then dopamine. A tyrosine analog called metyrosine can interfere with this step by competitive inhibition. Metyrosine was initially used as an antihypertensive, but because it non-selectively blocks all catecholamine synthesis, it has a wide range of side effects and is rarely used today for purposes other than research. Reserpine is another drug that can cause catecholamine depletion. Reserpine inhibits the packaging of catecholamines into presynaptic vesicles. Guanethidine replaces norepinephrine in vesicles and also decreases the amount of norepinephrine released from the synapse. In summary, metyrosine, reserpine, and guanethidine have different mechanisms of action, but all work to decrease sympathetic outflow. Some drugs, however, increase the concentration of norepinephrine in the synaptic cleft, leading to increased sympathetic outflow. Cocaine, tricyclic antidepressants, and amphetamine all increase the amount of norepinephrine in the synapse by preventing its reuptake into the presynaptic neuron. Amphetamine also stimulates norepinephrine release into the synaptic cleft. A crucial difference between the cholinergic synapse and the noradrenergic synapse is that norepinephrine is reabsorbed into the presynaptic membrane without being broken down first. Recall that acetylcholine esterase breaks down acetylcholine in the synapse. MAO and COMT are the enzymes responsible for breaking down catecholamines, but are located inside cells, not in the synaptic cleft. Therefore, the main method of clearing norepinephrine from the synaptic space is reuptake. Also note that the release of norepinephrine from the synaptic nerve ending is modulated by norepinephrine itself, acting on presynaptic alpha-2 autoreceptors. Sympathetic stimulation of alpha-2 receptors provides negative feedback and reduces sympathetic outflow. Activation of M2 receptors by acetylcholine also inhibits norepinephrine secretion, whereas activation of angiotensin II receptors increases norepinephrine secretion. Cholinomimetic agents all act to increase cholinergic outflow. 
What do meiosis, diarrhea, sweating, urination, bronchospasm, and lacrimation all have in common? They're all signs of increased parasympathetic nervous system activity. Sweating is actually a sympathetic response, but unlike most sympathetic responses, it is mediated by acetylcholine, so it can be caused by cholinomimetics. An easy way to think about this class of drugs is that they make people ooze from every orifice. That is, they increase secretions. With this in mind, it will be easier to remember that they can exacerbate certain conditions like COPD, asthma, or ulcers by increasing secretions of respiratory mucus or gastric acid. There are two major classes of cholinomimetic agents, direct agonists and indirect agonists. Let's first discuss direct agonists. Bethanacol, carbacol, pilocarpine, and methacholine are all direct agonists. In other words, they directly stimulate muscarinic receptors. Bethanacol is used for postoperative and neurogenic ileus and urinary retention. A useful mnemonic is, Bethany, call me if you want to activate your bowels and bladder. Carbacol is primarily used for glaucoma and works by stimulating pupillary contraction and release of intraocular pressure. Pilocarpine is a potent stimulator of sweat, tears, and saliva. It is resistant to acetylcholine esterase, giving it a long half-life. A helpful mnemonic to remember this is, you cry, drool, and sweat on your pilo instead of pillow. Methacholine is used as a diagnostic test for asthma. It stimulates muscarinic receptors in the airway when it is inhaled, and patients with asthma will be hypersensitive, leading to an exacerbation of their condition. Indirect agonists are a second class of cholinomimetic agents that work not by directly stimulating muscarinic receptors, but by inhibiting acetylcholine esterase, the enzyme responsible for breaking down acetylcholine, so acetylcholine that is present lasts longer. They therefore increase endogenous acetylcholine levels. Neostigmine is used primarily for postoperative and neurogenic ileus and urinary retention, long-term treatment of myasthenia gravis, and reversal of postoperative neuromuscular junction blockade. It is a quaternary amine, which means it is permanently charged and does not penetrate the central nervous system. To remember this, just think about how neo sounds kind of like no, so neostigmine is no CNS. Pyridostigmine is used for the long-term treatment of myasthenia gravis. It is also a quaternary amine and does not penetrate the CNS. Edrophonium is an extremely short-acting acetylcholine esterase inhibitor that is used for the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis. For example, suppose a patient presents with complaints of difficulty getting out of chairs and problems climbing stairs. Also, her husband has noticed that her left eyelid has been drooping the past couple of weeks after she comes home from work. When she presents in your office, you notice her left eyelid is drooping as well. You inject edrophonium and the drooping improves. What is your diagnosis? This patient presented with muscle weakness and ptosis, classic symptoms of myasthenia gravis. Improvement of symptoms with edrophonium is diagnostic for the condition. Why do her symptoms improve with edrophonium injection? To answer this, you need to remember the etiology of the disease. Myasthenia gravis is characterized by circulating antibodies that block the acetylcholine receptors at the postsynaptic neuromuscular junction and induces receptor downregulation over time. By increasing the availability of acetylcholine within the synaptic space with edrophonium, you are enhancing the ability of endogenous acetylcholine to outcompete the circulating antibodies for binding to acetylcholine receptors, allowing her muscles to function better. There are fewer spare nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the eyelid muscles than elsewhere in the body, so a reduction in the number of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in myasthenia gravis initially manifests clinically as eyelid droop. Physostigmine is used for treatment of glaucoma and atropine overdose. It is a tertiary amine and therefore does cross the blood-brain barrier, which is why it is useful for atropine overdose. Echothiophate is used to treat glaucoma. Donezepil is used to treat Alzheimer's disease and has been shown to improve cognition and behavior. The drug is believed to be helpful in Alzheimer's disease because it combats a reduction in acetylcholine levels caused by the death of cholinergic neurons in the brain. It is important to note that donezepil only transiently improves symptoms, but does not cure or alter the course of disease progression. With all cholinomimetic agents, be careful for exacerbation of COPD, asthma, and peptic ulcers when giving to susceptible patients. This is because these drugs cause bronchoconstriction and increase gastric acid release. Cholinesterase inhibitor poisoning occurs when a person ingests or absorbs too much of an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, which effectively causes an overdose of acetylcholine. This leads to the typical symptoms of oozing from every orifice, diarrhea and abdominal cramping, 
urination, meiosis, bronchospasm, bradycardia, excitation of skeletal muscle and the CNS, lacrimation, sweating, and salivation. These symptoms can be remembered with the mnemonic dumbbells. Remember that the symptom of sweating is unique in that it occurs via acetylcholine-mediated sympathetic activity. Cholinesterase inhibitor poisoning is typically due to organophosphates such as parathion or malathion, which are irreversible acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Because organophosphates have been used as ingredients in insecticides, the USMLE has often asked this question in the context of farmers. To treat cholinesterase inhibitor poisoning, you should administer atropine, a muscarinic antagonist, plus pralidoxime, a chemical antagonist used to regenerate active acetylcholinesterase. The caveat with pralidoxime is that it must be used within hours after poisoning occurs. If too much time passes, the inactivation of acetylcholine esterase will become permanent by a process termed aging, and pralidoxime will no longer be able to reverse the inhibition.